I'm now muted. <laughs> uh, so uh, I'll proceed in faith, which is always a good way to proceed. Imagine that everyone can hear me. Um, just wave your hands if you can hear me. <laughs> oh, good, good. Okay, good. Then we'll begin with a little uh, salutation to the triple gem and then uh, maybe some, some chanting and uh, do some meditation and then proceed as usual. So. <laughs>
So this um, process of centering, <clears throat> which I'm sure you're all familiar with, or at least <laughs> familiar with attempting to do, to get a clear uh, center from which to look at, perceive, come to terms with all the various inputs and outputs that are happening in the mind. Mm -hmm. the thoughts, the memories, possibilities, the uncertainties, the discomforts, other people, various phenomena that we experience is very much um, external, you could say, and yet in, very much involved with. It's a central quality that could actually scan that and get it in some kind of order where we feel more comfortable, settled, centering, settling. Um, and as we probably recognize, this is difficult to do. You can't do it with thought. Um, uh, because thought tends to create its own effects. But we can do it, strange enough, with the body. Because the body begins, if you focus on the experience of body, that focusing experience gives a focal point that is steady and the mind begins to center itself around that presence, that bodily presence. So direct experience of body, you might say whatever the body is experiencing circumstantially, body always experiences a sense of being right here and feeling things, feeling, here and feeling, here and sentient affected mm. here mm. direct and affected warmth coolness tingling vibrations discomfort comfort We're just getting a sense of a an awareness that, that just encompasses all of that, not going into any particular detail, but the whole bag of body embodiment. And you know, so feet, back, head, fingers. And you notice certain properties, such as the sense of a certain earth experience which is the experience of this has a certain extension of mass to it it's a certain massiveness massiness earthiness maybe spongy or rigid but it's got a, some kind of substance and it's probably got degrees of warmth to it warmth cool cold hot we can measure it in those terms because right now, when we're directly experiencing, we're not looking at it, but feeling body in itself. Experience movement, normally breathing, moving, it's one of the movements that occurs. And a sense of all this sticks together. It all belongs, it all infects its affects every bit, affects everything else. This is called the air element, the movement, the water element, the cohesive, um, internally uh, cohesive experience. All that shifting and We might notice as we 
come to terms with that. We can come to the edge of it. This is the, so we might find the boundary. This is where the body is. And also I can sense the space around that where it isn't. It's got a limited uh, presence. Coming to the edge of the body, so you experience the whole body forming, tingling, pulsing, twinging, warm, cool. All that arising or manifesting within a certain space where there's no pressure, you could imagine it's the boundary of your skin. space element and you're conscious of it consciousness element and if you hold these two in references the space and the consciousness the awareness of it then the body is experienced as a single thing and it's got various qualities arising within it but we're aware of the whole thing as an entity, then you realize such descriptions as knee, ankle, elbow, nose, they, they're not necessary. You can just dispense with those surplus descriptions and feel the flow of these elemental properties. Mm. Because this has a greater centering effect. If we go into the differences between this and that and that and that, you have a discursive or a scattering effect. You try to feel the wholeness of it, you have a simplifying centering effect. And this leads to the mind as a single focus, singularity of focus, a one pointedness of focus, which is this entire form as unity. And centeredness. And we're disengaging from any particular phenomenon, not getting mesmerized by it or fighting with it, or wondering what it's about, just disengaged, viveka. So your sense of your awareness of that is not activated uncluttered. And how that feels uh, as a heart quality, where the heart feels somewhat steadied, uh, established a singularity of focus. And does that feel better than a 
multiplicity of focuses? Does it feel calmer, cooler, more useful, more livable? Hmm. Maintain the disengagement. A lot of <laughs> habit to go into areas that are uncomfortable or curious. But try to resist that. Maintain the element of space and the element of consciousness or awareness. Let things be as they are that do maintain the whole form, including the boundary, the breathing, the movement, the warming, the simple elemental properties. And the quality of openness and goodwill towards this form experience of feeling form. and how this affects your heart, your mind. We slows it down a little, soothes it. So now we'll just um, pause on the meditation for now. Sampati Katanjali Anadi Varanaya Chata Santita Sata Paraja Kajatika De Se Judamang Anukam Pimang Pajang Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambhutasa Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambhutasa Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambhutasa Uddang dhammang sangham namasami So, greetings everyone. Uh, I haven't zoomed for a while. Uh, I've been uh, zooming internally <laughs> in my cootie in the in the forest. Uh, uh, so we get good to get back to this room again, and hopefully uh, this can be something that's of service to you, and we can continue these sessions for a few weeks anyway. Um, so how's it been? <laughs> How is it ever? 
How is it ever? How is experience? Isn't it always changing, shifting, amorphous? Uh, it's like the weather. You know, the weather. You know, is it good weather, bad weather, or is it just weathery weather? You know, violent storms, cool, calm passages, sunny days, sometimes dull. Mm. Now I like to pursue the theme of chitta, perhaps over the next few sessions. This is a central term in, in Buddhism. As you probably hear me referring to it many times, because mm. it is the cent most probably the central term apart from dukkha. <laughs> <laughs> and it's the more more uplifting central term. This is chitta, and the expression is uh, for liberated liberated chitta. And uh, often in the suttas, when someone becomes liberated, it says, you know, their their heart, their chitta is liberated from the asava through non clinging. Liberated from the asava, he has finished his rebirth. I've done what needs to be done. You know, that's it. The jitta has been released. So that's pretty important, isn't it, to know what that is. Um, one sets one's jitta up straight, direct. Mm. Nothing can do you so much harm as an untrained jitta. Nothing can do you so much good as a trained jitta. By, by an untrained jitta, a person is ruined. By a trained jitta, a person is blessed. Mm. One who is pure in chitta is called Buddha. Mm. So it's pretty important, right? Mm. Uh, and what, what, so what is this? And so naturally we try to find a word for it. Mind, heart, awareness, consciousness. These are the terms that are, tend to be used. Um, words are words. And Buddha was talking about direct experience, he never really explained what jitta was, he said what it does. And that jitta is both subject to ignorance, contamination and confusion, subject to asava, which means corrupting influences. Okay? It can also be liberated from these corrupting influences. Asava, things leak in. Uh, and what leaks in are tendencies to, to solidify and grasp and hold on. Mm. Now, so this is the main focus where we're really trying to look at. And how do we do this? What is it that looks at jitta? Mm. How can you be aware of jitta? Of course, here the language has problems, but uh, as we practice, we say, like here we have the very standard Satipatthana sequence, body, feeling, chitta, and then various phenomena or dhammas that are relevant to liberation or foundations for sati. So as we come in through body, directly experiencing body, you know, rather than thinking about body or seeing body with the eye, directly experiencing body, then this is seen as... Um, pretty essential in order to really realize what jitta is. Mm. Of course, it's through this sense of establishing a focus, one could acknowledge the very simple experience of body. There is both a, a, an experience that is effective, being affected, it's stirred, it's moving, it's warm, it's hard, it's soft, and there's an awareness of that. Mm. We have the two, you have an effective sense and awareness. And in the Satipatthana, this dual, innate dual experience, dual focus is also established around feeling and around jitta itself. Jitta is something that's affected, it's moving, it's changing its moods, it's happy, it says it's affected by passion, by aversion, and probably many other things. Um, it's affected by um, hatred by delusion, it's contracted, seizes up, it's extended, expands, 
It's exalted, it's lifted up. It's depressed, it sinks down, and so forth. So this is quite a, quite a phenomenon, isn't it? Again, so in the Satipatthana, you look at body, and you see the various forms the body can take, both an external form of corpse, flesh, blood, sinews, the internal form, breathing. Can't see it, but you certainly, it's happening. So you have a, something you can see with your eyes, external, something you sense, you feel is happening to you, internal, breathing. That's body too. Yet the internal, which is the most significant, because that's what keeps you alive, you, it's not a thing at all. You can't have a breathing. It's a, phenol it's a process. Yeah. You know, so with this, we begin to understand an internal, external. External means that which we can witness through an external sense base. Internal, that which is experienced directly in itself. And the two are our, found, our ways of coming to terms with experience come to terms with mind, external mind, we can say, oh, that's my aversion, that's my craving, that's my passion, I could name it, I could talk about it. When I'm experiencing it, what do I experience? I don't experience the thing with, with words on it, experience is a flush of heat, or a surging, or a cramping, or a tingling, or an opening. You know? These internal qualities that are wordless, you know? and often the internal experience is that which we are most um, moved by because the internal experience becomes myself. Notably, particularly with chitta, the internal experience of chitta is me. Here am I excited, or here am I saddened, here am I nervous, yeah, that becomes me. And at some point I can also, I can witness it. So there's, there's that bad habit. Again, that's that terrible bad habit I have. And then it becomes myself. Yeah. Me, myself. And these are internal, external references to chitta because this sense of I am is certainly uh, a way in which chitta can be um, noted. But of course, there isn't a person there. There isn't a person there. There's the manifestation of something that's subjective, familiar, highly affected, intimate, activated, yeah? very, very uh, vulnerable, sensitive, dynamic, uh, forceful. Yes, it's chitta, it's not self, it's not a person. It's a constantly moving, shifting, changing force. But this is the quality of chitta. The affected sense. As it's affected, it, it responds. Now, it's affected, it responds, it builds up a certain momentum drives. And these drives get habitual because chitta, as it's affected and responds, is also kind of learning something. It's learning that will take me there. I think that will get me there. That will get me what I want. That will get me away from what I don't want. So it establishes particular tracks that it runs along. This is how I get away from pain. This is how I get to what I desire. This is how I avoid things. Yeah. This is how I, I don't notice anything. This is how I focus. Yeah. So it gets a lot of these qualities, intentions, chitanas, chitta and chetana. It gets, it gets activated and it learns particular intentions. And these intentions are an aspect of what's called sankhara. They're formative tendencies because as you follow them, they become ingrained. So they become the tracks down which your jitta will run. You get habitual. It learns certain things. It learns certain things and it runs down those tracks. And those tracks become quite can be quite quite rigid. So one becomes bound by the limitations of one's habits. And to move outside that is scary, weird, uncomfortable. I don't feel like myself. And in meditation, oh, it's good. 
good if you don't feel like yourself. That's really good. You feel disoriented, and uh, um, that's really good. <laughs> it's not comfortable, but it's good because you're not following your own tracks anymore. So often meditation is a pretty should be a fairly disorienting experience. In order to to freshen up, you've got to come to a place where you just, uh, and not run down the tracks. But the tracks are very, very attractive. That's what tracks are, the attractives. And our attention scans experience. And that's jitter too, scanning experience. And here's, I can go that way, I can go that way. This also is jitter. Or another aspect of the sankharas that jitters arise. Affective, affected, responsive, learns, gets habitual. As it gets habitual, it gets stuck in its habits. Uh, and those habits become, I am this, I can't be anything other than this, this is what I am, I have to have this, I can't do that. We build a prison, or Chitta builds its own prison through this. It learns, but its learning is biased by ignorance, by not what it doesn't know is Nibbana. It doesn't know the way out of suffering. It doesn't know the way it release. That's what it doesn't know. So it can construct all kinds of formations, citta sankharas, that will perpetuate it in the conditioned world. In the world of sense, social contact, roles, purposes, and so forth. But it won't get out of that. So this is what's called rebirth. So we understand this quality of jitta and how affected it is, but also begin to acknowledge it's also this what we call the mirror-like quality, the mirror, noetic, perhaps it's a strange word, jitta can witness. It can witness itself. Now this may seem odd, like how can you, how can a jitter witness itself? Well, you see how a body, for example, can um, feel pain and know it feels pain without having to think about it. It immediately has pain. It gets that immediately. It doesn't have to have a separate. It's both involved with its experience and also by itself already knowing its experience. So we know something's hot. We don't have to think, oh, that's hot. You put a finger in the fire, the body knows it's hot and jumps out before we can think about it. It knows it's hot because it, it <laughs> that's the nature of, 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 of awareness and intelligence, which is actually in everything. Everything has this, everything living thing has this thing. So chitta can be both knowing and affected at the same time. You can know it's being affected. How does it know it's being affected? Because there's a certain energetic shift. We feel heightened, we feel shoved, we feel reactive, we feel soothed. You know, and it witnesses these, it's aware of these. You can know that. Now with some training, you can put more and more focus on the knowing of experience, of effectiveness, so you can feel the discomfort but not react to it, not blame somebody else for it, not blame yourself for it, because that doesn't go to Nibbana. Um, why well, go there? Why well, add more? And by bringing your awareness onto the effective sense and not following it, gradually that particular track wears out. Unless we follow it, the less we carve that track. So we can feel something's not going the way I like it. Mm -hmm. It's like this. I don't say I like it. And eventually, don't say anything. It's, 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 it's stopped. <laughs> so these effects can be, um, through knowing these effects can be um, uh, moderated or they will tend to moderate themselves not by trying to moderate them just the fact of awareness itself 
moderates these effects. This is a very important thing to know. Yeah. So the effective sense and the learning sense, which is often very um, biased, and there's a knowing sense, effective sense, and there's a volitional sense that drives, moves forward, wants to make something happen. And the other feature which makes it so <coughs> also vital is that jitta has centrality to it. <coughs> It means experiences, there's no particular set boundaries. So one can be the jitta, you can be aware of feelings in your body. You could be within that boundary. You could focus on you know, the um, memories in your mind. You could be within that. You could focus on the people you know, you could bring those to mind. So it can more or less include whatever you set your attention to. <coughs> There's no fixed boundary, the boundary can change. It can extend over the whole planet. It can extend over a year of your life. It can extend over the day. It can extend over the welfare of another person. Um, so it's, it can be a very small, but it could be just the edge of your breathing. It could be that small. There's no specific boundary, but what it always has, very specific center to it. I am aware of that. So the center is held by I am. Mm -hmm. And this is the fundamental, you might say the fundamental problem, is this contamination of jitta. It, it is centered, but it is predominantly self-centered. Mm -hmm. I am aware of this. With this then there come in all kinds of subjective biases because the the i am begins to acquire personal preferences <clears throat> uh, and then everything is seen from that perspective what i like what i don't like i look at that and i don't think she's the way she should be i look at that i'm aware of that that seems a mess to me and i look at that that's i really like to have one of those and i remember this and you know so this sense of self affects the center and narrow and keeps it <clears throat> in the wrong place. So as we practice, uh, we start to deliberately generate uh, alternative center. First center we try to establish is the center of ethics. You know, whether I like her or him, I don't abuse, I don't lie, I don't steal, I don't we begin to establish jitta centered in ethics <clears throat> and this what ethics actually means because why is so it, it's definitely doable because the nature of jitta though it has a center it's always trying to find itself in a state of harmony with what's around it it doesn't want to be in conflict it doesn't really have to defending itself or fighting things it wants to feel comfortable yeah. So it has a sense of how can it be comfortable, how can it be comfortable, and essentially what Chitta moves towards is either law, justice, systems, you know, external structures, you do this, you do that, I'll be here, you do that, this is the rule, yeah. which is an external measurement, we can write it down, these are the seven rules, these are the ten rules, this is the protocol, everybody does that, we'll be in harmony. It's an external measurement and it's an internal measurement, which is empathy, which means, well, however you are, I feel I want to be kind and tolerant and open and, you know, and share with you and find how we can make a kind of get on with each other with our funny habits. <laughs> so these two are the kind of feelers of chitta. And they come together as ethics. Um, and the ethics is not exactly like law and order, but it's a sense of appropriate convention according to what's 
we both makes us both feel most upright and comfortable. Yeah, we, we're respectful to each other. And it's a funny, funny, funny thing, you know, the amount of laws there are in any society, the number of laws, every year there's more laws created. <laughs> every day there's another law being created and there's more police and more law courts or more people getting, going to jail and more people breaking laws. I think, well, law and order doesn't seem to work very well, does it? <laughs> Yeah, because what's missing is empathy. So, it, it, you know, it, in, in Buddhist practice, there's a sense of justice. It's not exactly the same as law. It's a sense of, you know, how we get on, reasonable, reasonable boundaries, you know. And essentially, it's based upon respect. Whereas law, it's generally not based upon respect at all. <laughs> it's based upon an idea from, you know, an idea, maybe a good idea. Uh, people shouldn't drive faster than this. That's a good idea, but very much a theory. It doesn't, it's a, you know, you can't drive faster than 60 miles an hour. That's not a bad idea as an idea. But it depends. If you're drunk, you shouldn't be driving at all. If you can't drive, you shouldn't, you can't drive very well, you shouldn't drive faster than 20. So it's a matter of Buddhist ethics very much makes it much more personal, much more subjective. What works for you? What works for me? How do we work together? What's a harmonious way of living? This is very much a jitter experience. This, this itself is a huge training when you're with, with people. Uh, fundamental because it's not about um, the right system you know if you tr monasteries you try to run a kitchen in a monastery you realize that after a while law is not going to make the, the kitchen comfortable we create 15 rules of how the food should be cooked that does not make a comfortable kitchen you've got six people there trying to cook up some food give them a load of rules, what will happen is somebody will break a rule and somebody else will criticise them for it. You know? Or they can't. You know? And you say, well, actually, what we need to do is, hello, how are you? Um, what should we do today? How can we make this work for each other? Uh, give me some advice, you know, uh, let me know what's going on or it's difficult, um, can I, how can I support you? Actually, empathy. And then with empathy, you can create a reasonable structure. This is jitter. This is certainly the way to, to operate as a group. Sangha tends to operate that way. We have all kinds of training rules, but essentially, they're just, uh, they're, there's no rule. There's no punishment involved. It's just, you know, Main thing is that the harmony of the Sangha is kept through fellow feeling and trust and mutual respect. This is a chitta property. You establish that, then that creates a sense of stability and comfort and ease. That means you don't have to have things going exactly my way anymore. You, know, you don't have to have a narrow system that I, this is the way I want it to be, because it's too uncomfortable to keep trying to impose that upon life, <laughs> right? Because life doesn't do that. It doesn't go the way I want it to, uh, no matter how many laws you create. So instead, we begin to place the, the prioritized chitta rather than mental construction, conventional construction into situation and very much the case with other human beings but one should certainly extend it to the world in general to creatures plants animals you know and even to certainly to your own body what is the body capable of doing today what's its capacity respectful mm. i was saying to somebody the other day it was, 
getting rather old and people were saying, well, maybe he's got dementia. Senile, I said, well, maybe. But like all of us, as you get older, you generally tend to lose your cognitive faculties. There's no such label, you know, where suddenly, you know, there's a general diminution of cognitive capacity. I can't remember things like I used to be able to. Um, what counts is how you, how you handle it, how you manage it, how you live in harmony with it, how you, right, how you relate to it. So this very fundamental property of respect, relationship with experience, uh, which should be there as the first base for stabilizing and evening out and settling the mind. You come into meditation, what you call meditation when you're sitting still or walking or standing, we call it meditation now. It's really just refined ethics. How does this body sit? In this condition, how does it sit? How's it most comfortable? How do I come to terms with it, relate to it, a body in this particular condition, sick? We always assume the idea is, you know, meditation body it sits cross-legged, it sits upright, it's always healthy. <laughs> There's no room for ill health. Ill health is a disaster. Um, you can't meditate if, you, if you're sick. Well, the nature of the body is to be sick. So why don't we stop, take the word meditation, just put it to one side. So how do you relate to st stabilizing, settling into your body when it is, when its health is not strong? Then you begin to really know how, what meditation is as a relational experience using your chitta, not your thinking mind, but your direct experience. <clears throat> and this is, so there's, there's, a, there's a knowing of it and you're being affected by certain sensations, feelings, energies, and you respond to them. And whether one's healthy, distressed, agitated, um, you know, depleted, this is cultivation. Cultivation is not becoming a bronze Buddha Rupa. Cultivation is this kind of work of meeting the unpredictable, amorphous nature of experience and how I relate to it. So in the relationship, that becomes the center. Right? So instead of the I am the center, with my wishes, my aims, my ideas, my theories, you know, my expectations, the center of it is relationship. Doesn't that make sense? As a, in the conditioned world, in the world of conditions, the lowest number you can get is two, not one. There's never a single condition. There's always two at least, right? There's say my mind and my body, my awareness and my thoughts, uh, my emotions and my reactions to them. So there's at least two. Wouldn't it therefore be most harmonious to not favor one, but to favor how the two get on with each other, right? How the two get on with each other. And that be much more a topic for wisdom, a clear discernment. Then the mirroring effect of the mind is discerning how these energies cooperate. When you discern that, that balance, that discernment is 
center, not the phenomena, not the mood or the feeling or the thought, but the discernment. So it's balanced. It's not tipping, we're not favoring or rejecting. That is both the center, it's also settled because it's not based upon anything that can change. That's why it's supremely settled. Because it's not based upon the feeling or the emotion or the thought or the physicality or the energy. It's based upon the relationship. Now the items in that relationship can change, but the quality of relatedness is dispassionate, calm, disengaged, sensitive, open. This is a possibility for Chitta. This is our first base where we begin to bring around the quality of unbinding, Nibbana. Nibbana, the unbinding, which means that instead of these inbuilt assumptions and attitudes and aims that we run down, like railway tracks, the mind races down, it gets very good at it, it's very fast at it, it enjoys it, it loves that race down to that nice clear central plan of what I'm going to do, have and organize everything and, you know, and, and this is this and she's that and I'm this and I, that's Thursday and tomorrow, da, 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 da. it likes that, but that does not go to Nibbana. That's the railway to Sangsara. That's Sangsara Express. Yeah. Pull up the tracks. Well, don't even pull up the tracks, but find the place which doesn't have a track. This is the point, the balancing point, which is sensitive, aware, attuned. It doesn't rest upon an opinion, a purpose, an idea of a future. It doesn't aim to get anywhere. It doesn't try to state anything about what I am. It's empty. So it stands on purely on itself, not upon any phenomena or any noumena, any knowingness, any ideas. Therefore, this is called the supatita chitta. The chitta that is placed upon itself. So this is our first basis. From this, we don't really have to do a lot of uprooting because the quality of that has such a almost like a quietly galvanizing power. Collected, a samadhi power. The chitta, when it knows that fit, it doesn't want the others, the tracks begin to fade out because in fact they're not physical tracks, they're purely created by mental habits. The mental habit ceases, the tracks fade out. So this is your first basis and this you begin to understand quite a few things. Constructions of the mind, these are the sankharas, which are generally can be quite good not necessarily bad at all, effective, efficient, um, but not nibbonic because they keep going and you have to keep running down them and keep them in good repair and, get, and eventually they do tend to fade out as you become less able to keep keeping them going. Now this is something to, to, to really learn because you, you know, you, you don't want to be trying to keep all that stuff going when you're 85 years old. You know, and the planning and the organizing and, the, 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 and I want this and I can't do that. You meet people who do that, still trying to do that when they're 85, really miserable, desperate. So you said, just get off track, you don't need it. And so this, um, of course, this is often these tracks are complements to one's sense of identity. 
I am someone, I can do this, I go this way, I can get things done, I never do that. So the sense of self and the sense of the tracks complement and reinforce each other. So when you shift away from the self center to the ethical relational center of citta, it's still got the property of knowing, it still has the property of being affected, it's sensitive, but it's no longer based upon history and personhood. This is our main preliminary basis. As you notice, as you sit in meditation, when your mind is tracks, it will build your personal world. Like that. There's no effort at all. Your personal world, your preoccupations, tomorrow, your work, your family, your health, who you're concerned with, personal dilemma. It's embarrassing how much one personal world becomes a total picture of life. <laughs> it's really astonishing and embarrassing how my preoccupations can be 100% of my, <laughs> my attention <laughs> and nothing else matters. <laughs> I can sit there in meditation. Nobody's bothering me. Nobody's giving me a hard time. I can create misery out of the terrible deal I'm getting, da, 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 of course, somebody doesn't respect me. <laughs> or yesterday she did this and I told her not to. You know, your personal world can occupy all the space of your mind. And completely convincing that this is really what you need to get into to sort it out. That is, that's the track. And that's what the, these currents, these asava, these influxes, they know those tracks and they pump energy down those tracks and they create the personal world that then we try to make it, everything else fit into it. <laughs> this is why, you know, the, the barna is called, you know, when you've eliminated these asava, so the energies don't run down those tracks, then your, your awareness is not preoccupied with me, mine, and what happened to me, and why I don't, and how I could. What a lot of burden off the mind. So, so then, of course, this is, you know, how do you do this? Start the shift to relational basis. How am I with my body? How, do, how am I with an angry mood? How does my body feel an angry mood? How do I calm the angry mood in my body? How do I come to the terms of the fact that I'm not always so nice? Yeah. I'm not the cut out that I like to be. I'm not, not the nice, easygoing person that I think I should be all the time. How do I come to terms with that? How do I relate to that? How does my body relate to it? And in that relationship, we learn all the skills of wisdom and compassion and kindness and clarity and of course non-attachment no clinging and this is nirvana here and now so pause there for your reflection in a few moments to turn things over uh, anything useful um, you might like to, to bear in mind and I'll, I'll return to these themes over the next few weeks if conditions support. Um, and keep, because everything in the world goes the other way from what I'm talking about. Andamayan, Ovarakataya, Sadhu, Karanda, Dama, Sadhu, Sadhu. Sadhu Anumodami So I'll give yourself a couple of minutes, two or three minutes, if there's any particular phrases that come to mind, you might even want to write them down to think about them later. 
real points you hadn't considered, you'd like to linger on. Okay, we'll um, sign off with the salutation to the Triple Gem and um, <coughs> if conditions support it, we never quite know what's going to turn up these days, uh, I shall be occupying a Zoom room around the same time <coughs> next week, whatever the time is for you now, that's the time it could be next week. So have a good week, everyone. Good to see you all again. <laughs>